It is evident by observation of this world that anything existing here is subject to time, therefore being vulnerable to aging and to corruption, and so being vulnerable also to besmirchment. These weaknesses are the characteristics of death, or not life. However, that is only what is experienced in the world. Something else, something living, that lies at the center of it all, fueling it and observing it, is always untouched. Death is, therefore, a twisted reflection or copy of true life, mimicking only forms and vague substance, but unable to be itself the same essence. This is because that which is a dead copy or reflection exists here to be contemplated upon by life, as that living essence resolves its conflicting, addicting potential. Life is both innocent and immutable, so how can it acquire wisdom? It can only do so by observation, not by transformation. So we come upon a realm where everything is conflicting with and conspiring against innocence and immutability, those very core traits of true life. In this setting, not only is everything unavoidably mutable, but also attacked at its innocence. For example, cubs are the preferred prey of predators, being naive and weaker than their fellow adults. And, mind you, here it is implied all types of predation, not merely hunting for food. Or the stronger of a brood will often subdue and torment the weaker brother or sister, even to the extent of fratricide, because its innocence and weakness in this realm are not only linked together, but hated by the very world whose nature promotes their representatives to attack them. Still, given that time is an indelible factor linked to all that is not living, and consequently linked to this world itself and its experiences, sooner or later the stronger perpetrator is itself weakened eventually and also attacked. Pride brews in the strong as much as shame grows in the weak. As stated in the presentation named Stories, Myths versus Hoaxes, a myth is an allegory that attempts to point towards truth. What originated the current version of the Judeo-Christian myth tells us that we were naked in the beginning. This is a clear metaphor that is nonetheless based upon the moment of human birth in this world, as we are all born naked in the sense of having no clothing. Still, what does naked mean in the metaphor? Some will vehemently hold on to a literal interpretation, maybe simply because they are, at that moment, unable to discern any other interpretation beyond the physical and literal. However, when contemplated upon, different meaning can be extracted from that premise. Creation is an act of mirroring, and this realm is itself one such mirror. Like any mirror, it shows an imperfect image, with less dimensions than the actual object being reflected, for starters. A mirror will show a 2D image of a 3D object, but also an inverted image that is subject to and dependent on the position and intensity of light. What is seen in that mirror is therefore not truth, of course, but an attempt at a potential reflection, that is, it is a false perception of truth and life. It is merely clothing and adornment in motion over time. False perception of that false image in the mirror can then become false identification if the observer becomes enamored in its essential innocence with that reflection wearing those clothes and adornments, giving rise to any type of vanity. And note that vanity is already a subset of pride. 
False identification then solidifies the clothed and adorned reflection as a perceived self, as the original true and living self submerges underneath the layers of clothes, where it continues to observe the experiences of the several movie characters that it will wear in the mirror. Some will be more leaning towards what, in the reflected image, seems to be good, others towards what seems to be evil, others will be ambiguous and even outright bipolar. Still, like a picture of Dorian Gray, the mirror will show to the fragments of life what are the results of certain potential choices, if innocence decides to identify with them. Consequently then, innocence has to be attacked by the false reflection in the mirror that has received identification, because that innocence represents the dangerous trait of an original truth that, if manifest, will remove all the clothes, adornments that give form to the false self, thus dissolving its identification, taking off its mask, killing it. So the forms or shapes in the mirror are defended by the identification with the false self, be them of good shapes that make the conscious proud and the subconscious ashamed, or of evil shapes that make the conscious ashamed and the subconscious proud. Neither shapes are truth or life, as neither are the original metaphorical nakedness. Life, true life, is naked because it is immutable and innocent. That is the metaphor, isn't it? In it resides no pride nor shame, but being innocent and unchangeable, it needs to try on clothes through a surrogate self and look at it in a mirror to acquire wisdom through experience. Layers and layers of clothing which are mental characters, and adornments, which are mental traits, are experienced over an Im immeasurable amount of time. Yet, beyond the observation and experience of both pride and shame, of all metaphorical items of clothing and adornment, truth remains observant and untouched beneath all those layers. That is what I like to call a fragment of life. That fragment of truth will come out unscathed from anything experienced in the mirrored world, but it will have still acquired wisdom from contemplating those mirror experiences. As it does so, it will eventually realize that the most appropriate and beautiful reflection of itself is metaphorical nakedness that is the letting go of all clothing and adornments, be them good or evil. I am certain all of us have, at one point or another, experienced that childlike innocence as a re-emergence in our script character adult lives. Some felt it as they fell in love with someone, for example, others as they had some sort of spiritual realization, and so on and so forth. But why doesn't it last, then, in almost all cases? Well, yes, firstly, because it is the nature of the mirror realm to be subject to time and change, like we said, so nothing here will be permanent, sure. But what, then, hastens the dissolution of that feeling of childlike innocence for us? It is our own false self-identification, sabotaging us from within. Naturally conspiring with the identification with the false selves of others around us and the very mirror world itself, but the perpetrator is not external but internal. The one who attacks the living child as soon as it emerges is not out there but in here. It has good reason to do so. If innocence lingers, the false self-identification has to die. So it is only fighting for its survival, or better said, 
for the survival of its form, because it is only a shape, not an essence. Have you ever considered why neither the good nor the evil can stand innocence? The first will try to mold it, to control it out of existence in the world. The others will try to taint it, to deviate it, and to destroy it from manifesting here. Why? Because be them good shapes or evil shapes, shapes can only exist with identification, and innocence, that original type of living true innocence, dissolves identification, thus starving the forms of their sustenance. As the false reflections, or shadows, attack innocence, they are actually only able to eat that which is compatible with them. The very false shapes generated earlier that form metaphorical tumors over that untarnished living innocence underneath. Please refer to the contemplation named Metaphors of Tumors for this reference. So, truth be told, if truth would speak words, that is, yes, pun intended, the identification with the false self or shapes in the mirror is not our enemy. It is not our friend either, but just a device we placed before us to show us our potentials, so that our unchangeable and innocent living fragments could achieve wisdom and sort of refined themselves. We are writing and acting and watching a movie all at once, and we got to attach to it, to identify with it. However, we are not abandoned. True, living, innocent and immutable, but also wise relatives have intervened to save us. Relatives that have already been through a mirror of their own. And that savior, that is, the intervening help that entered the mirror dream world, will always be a force that will give back innocence, first and foremost, as the metaphorical naked newborn child the true life is unchangeably. Yet, this time, after all these dreams and reflections, there will be wisdom in that innocence as well. That is, symbolically speaking, a child that is born, already grown up, having been through and healed from addiction to identification, or, if one prefers further symbolic language, a child that is born naked, innocent, and yet wise, out of a virgin, a virgin birth, a birth of innocence.